I thought we can carry on from yesterday a little bit and at the beginning maybe I'll just reiterate the um, definition of enlightenment and then add in something which <clears throat> can be confusing which is a description about peak experiences, spiritual experiences, awakening experiences because when <clears throat> these awakening experiences happening or peak experience happen, happen they, they're so perfectly in line with what um, a lot of spiritual descriptions are um, you can have a spiritual experience that is just love complete love, nothing else but love that's what floods the body or floods the whole, whole moment you can have <clears throat> peak experiences that are oneness experiences where subject and object which is the way the normal experience is constructed, collapse and there is a sense that now this is what reality is, that this is real and um, the sense of the individual as an individual collapses and there is this open awareness that seems to envelop everything. So I'll talk more about spiritual experiences in a, in a little, little bit. Um, but <clears throat> if we talk about the word enlightenment, going back thousands of years um, the subject was known by some people who um, awakened and the process uh, became complete and they felt compelled um, it's just something that moves through you and that knowing is there that if anyone is interested to share um, explanations or descriptions pointers guidance um, and so going back thousands of years we can see books that um, have this information in them um, but the language is a bit um, well it's unique um, and it's carried over into this time but then there are other descriptions using um, different vocabulary that may clarify a few things so if we look at the traditional um, relationship to the word enlightenment people often um, look at uh, teachers or gurus who have um, made a mark in history um, and in a way there's this assumption that it can't happen to you or me um, that if it does happen um, it's going to be something so extraordinary um, that in fact you won't be considered an ordinary human um, because this sort of godly event has happened um, and that relationship to the word enlightenment already sets up a little bit of a, a barrier in spiritual seeking. Um, it sets up an expectation that might not be accurate and lots of other um, uh, games that the ego can play with this sort of superiority, inferiority, there can be a desire for it to happen, there can be an expectation that it can't happen because I'm not good enough, all sorts of different things. So um, let's talk about what you know, Buddha said enlightenment <coughs> is the end of suffering he made it very clear and simple he didn't phrase it in a positive frame but rather in a negative way it's not the gaining of anything but the absence of something um, and if we get rid of any notion of this spiritual word enlightenment and just ask ourselves practically what is it that we're looking for in life um, what is all this seeking about and we come up with the answer that actually we've always been looking for happiness everyone is looking for happiness um, and that word happiness is undefined um, and people are trying to find it in their own way um, people believe that um, happiness for one person is different to happiness for another so one person is seeking it um, seeking happiness through fame or fortune someone else is seeking it through family and friends someone else through career and money and if we look at that, the, the seeking for happiness seems to be an ex external seeking, a seeking for happiness through the acquisition of things. The um, happiness is going to come when I get somewhere. Um, happiness is something to be found out there. Um, now, the explanations that have been given throughout time is that actually happiness is never to be found outside, but rather it's coming to know yourself. It's um, about a movement inwards rather than a movement outwards. Um, and in practical terms, if we say, what is my unhappiness in everyday living? 
um, because it's very hard to answer what our happiness is when we don't necessarily have a good um, experience of it. Um, so if we go from that point of view, what's my happiness, I have to take someone else's explanation of what this happiness is. Um, so if we start looking at it for ourselves and we ask, what is my unhappiness in life? When is it that I feel unhappy? We, we will <clears throat> um, find that it's when we feel uncomfortable with ourself or uncomfortable with the other. And being uncomfortable with the other is actually just an uncomfortableness with oneself. Um, or an uncomfortableness with life, which also is an uncomfortableness with oneself. So we can say that my unhappiness in life is feeling uncomfortable with myself. The sense of feeling uncomfortable with myself can equate to not feeling whole or not feeling complete. And hence, there is this um, automatic assumption that um, in order to be complete, I need to ac acquire things. But if we stick with the actual experience and don't go to the next stage of assuming what it is that will fix this, we find that it's an uncomfortableness with oneself, which is my unhappiness. And that uncomfortableness um, we can call suffering. Um, and that suffering we can um, explain as energies that arise in daily living and in different forms. So suffering arises in the form of guilt and blame, worry, expectation, and pride and under each of those headings there are different forms of guilt so there can be insecurity lack of self-worth um, shame guilt for one's actions that have hurt someone else under blame we can have resentment jealousy hatred malice um, under pride it's uh, generally um, less intense than guilt and blame but it's based on the same um, principle and that principle is that I am the doer of my actions and the other is the doer of their actions so if we have pride at some point that pride is going to turn into um, <clears throat> guilt or blame um, but even the the posit what seems like a positive feeling of pride um, is an uncomfortableness with oneself because it's really not what we are we aren't the doers so pride is, is a form of suffering <laughs> Um, and blame, if we go back to blame, blame can be something which is, seems justifiable in life. If a car stops on a road where it's not meant to stop and we have to slam on the brakes behind this car, naturally we might have these thoughts, you know, what a stupid place to, to stop. Um, where did you get your license? Or, you know, that thought process is blame in a subtle form. And then that um, can become more intense depending on... Um, the situation we find ourselves in. Um, if it's a more dramatic situation, then it may not just be light blame, it might turn into heavy hatred. Um, so this unhappiness we have is the arising of suffering um, in the form of guilt, blame, pride, worry and expectation. Um, so we can now conclude that our happiness is actually not the acquiring of anything, but finding us in a position where suffering doesn't arise when the flow of life delivers pain which is what has caused suffering to arise in the past um, we can call that happiness which is the absence of suffering peace of mind so really enlightenment is an occurrence that happens that after it has happened means the person no longer experiences suffering when life delivers pain and that we can call continuous unbroken peace of mind so enlightenment is simply happiness for the human and happiness for the human is continuous unbroken peace of mind now when we're seeking we're reading lots of books and um, certain teachings um, come from a different point of view they describe the nature of oneself rather than looking what's in the way the 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 explanation is to come from the other side and to give descriptions of what oneself is to try and remember remind and awaken um, the awareness or the sense of self to what it really is instead of it continuing to misidentify itself with something it's not um, <clears throat> and when those descriptions are given, words such as awareness, consciousness, openness, bliss, um, 
uh, universal love um, are used stillness brilliance um, the brightness of a million suns um, and oneness um, end of separation and at some point along the way we have experiences that we can call mystical experiences or peak experiences and those experiences when they happen tend to be treated as though they're something very very significant they are a sign that the spiritual process is working that understanding is starting to happen and that's true it's not problematic to draw that conclusion as long as we don't hang on to it too strongly hang on to those ideas too strongly but what can become problematic is that the nature of those experiences the nature of those peak experiences can be so profound and can be so complete and can match so precisely the descriptions that are given in certain books and teachings that the assumption is that enlightenment is this experience forever um, what normally happens is the experience comes it lasts for a period of time five minutes ten minutes one day two days a month and then it ends um, and when it ends we draw the conclusion ah that is what enlightenment is but at the point when enlightenment really happens it'll remain <coughs> remain like this forever and so the assumption is that now um, the experience of life is going to change not only um, in one way but in total experience so the state in which we experience life is going to change dramatically um, and match these peak experiences when I went to my teacher um, Ramesh after having a peak experience and it was a peak experience that was so profound where um, the sense of subject object fell away the sense of being an individual fell away completely the sense um, that all there was was consciousness, that everything that arose in the moment was made of consciousness, um, was recognized by consciousness, that the body um, was not anything to do what, with what I was, and the I in that moment was a very impersonal sense of I. It was um, intertwined with the awareness that everything arose in, and it matched perfectly traditional non-advaitic um, descriptions of what the true self is um, so it made sense that after the experience which lasted for about 10 minutes ended um, the conclusion was ah that was a free sample of enlightenment um, and now my job is to make it come back and when it comes back it needs to last forever so Given that this seemed like an extremely significant event, I booked a ticket and went to Mumbai, sat quietly um, in the satsang until it seemed appropriate to have a discussion with um, Ramesh. And I described this experience. And as soon as I finished describing it, and I used the words that I thought were most appropriate to try and convey what, I, what had happened, and Ramesh looked at me and he said, Roger, it's just an experience. Don't worry about it. Now, this shocked me a little bit. And so I said, well, actually, maybe I didn't describe it correctly. And so I changed some words and represented it to him. And I felt, yes, now I've done a good job. So now he'll understand. And he said, Roger, it's just an experience. Let it go. And so I thought, OK, I'll let and then, no, no, I, so I tried explaining it again, different term. The third time, Roger, it's just an experience, let it go. So at the end of that, I thought, I started questioning. I thought, maybe he doesn't know what I've experienced. Like, actually, maybe he hasn't experienced what I've experienced. Maybe he, his idea of enlightenment is, is incorrect, is not complete. Um, and that he's talking from a perspective that's not complete. Um, and so I left holding on to that idea because that is what made most sense to me because this experience was so profound that I couldn't accept and, and 
matched, this is the important thing, it matched the description so closely that I couldn't accept that this wasn't a sample of what enlightenment was. Um, and so for several weeks and even months, I walked around waiting for this to happen again, trying to recreate it. Um, I would walk the same path that I had walked, and as I got to the same point in the walk, I would sort of hope that as I took the step, it would suddenly happen again. And I realized that um, wanting it to happen, trying to make it happen, being upset that it hasn't happened, um, was becoming a whole new set of suffering. Um, and as that suffering got greater and greater, his words came back into my mind, Roger, it's just an experience. Don't worry about it. And I thought, well, actually, have you considered that he could be right? Have you considered that what he's saying is real wisdom coming from um, an experience of transformation that he's had and having gone through the same mistakes that I might have gone through? And in that moment, I realized that actually the suffering that was building up here was because I wasn't accepting that it's just an experience. Let it go. And that recognition was enough for me to at least try to open my mind up to it being something different to what I was concluding. So I went back over CDs and talks that I had and his description of enlightenment started to stand out more and more. That enlightenment is simply the end of suffering. <coughs> enlightenment for the human being is happiness and happiness for the human being is continuous, unbroken peace of mind regardless of circumstance. So then I thought, well, it doesn't mean that, because in that experience, there was no way that suffering could arise. There was no entity that could suffer. suffer. There was nothing that could happen in that moment. I, the thought even arose, someone can come and chop my arms off, and it would have nothing to do with what I am or who I am. Um, and so then, going back to the description that enlightenment is simply unbroken peace of mind, I concluded maybe it doesn't have to come in the form of this profound experience. Maybe I can still have the experience of being an individual entity um, and have this unbroken peace of mind. Um, and so with more and more thinking, it became apparent that um, what may be the case is that we continue to have the experience of being a separate entity um, and that experience is not going to end, but with a knowing that comes from various insights and experiences, um, a knowing that actually what we really are is not a separate entity, but that source in which everything arises, of which everything is made, and from which everything is recognized. And in the peak experience that was shown experientially, but the benefit of the experience was not for, um, for it to be there forever, but rather for conclusions to be drawn that can then be attributed to daily living. And that is the knowing that what we really are is awareness, what we really are is unaffected by the flow of life, what we really are is not time-bound, not changing, what we really are is something that is constant. But the experience of daily life is going to be one of being a separate individual sitting in a chair, talking to other individuals, but with the knowing that this is just an appearance, just an illusion, and that when this body dies, or if something happens to this body, it's not really happening to what I really am. And so with the understanding that comes as part of the spiritual process and is a cumulative um, process that at some point 
um, culminates in um, an understanding that at the time may not even be recognized. It's not an understanding that we can see and say, this is my understanding. I have a total understanding. Actually, we, ha we know, we can conclude that we have a total understanding, which is not my understanding, but rather something that has happened in the flow of life because of one's destiny. Um, we conclude that there is a total understanding because we look back over a period of time, one month, six months, and we realize actually life has been happening, good things happening, bad things happening, pleasure happening, pain happening. The pleasure was experienced and let go of, the pain was experienced and let go of, and all along suffering hasn't arisen. And so it's actually something that we can wake up to in hindsight and say, wow, the understanding must be total because suffering is not arising in the way it used to before. Could it be that this process is actually that simple, that subtle, um, and not necessarily what we've assumed it to be, where one day lightning is going to strike and bells are going to start ringing, angels come down from heaven, maybe the body dissolve into, um, into you know, universal consciousness? Um, and so having said that, um, in a way we're demystifying it, but life can never really be demystified. Um, this process can never be demystified because what life is, is actually quite, is totally mystical. Um, so it can never re be demystified, but hopefully what we can do is get rid of some of the confusion that arises when we have descriptions or ideas about things that are not necessarily that accurate. <coughs> and so with that understanding, with the knowing that what we really are is consciousness, that the essence of this human being is impersonal consciousness, that when the body dies, impersonal consciousness will return to where it came from, and actually while the body is alive, that impersonal consciousness is not disconnected from where it has actually come from. So with the understanding that what I am is a three-dimensional human biological instrument to which universal consciousness has identified and is functioning through as personal consciousness, with that understanding, from time to time when there's nothing to do in the flow of life and one sits back and relaxes, the consciousness which is centralized in the body can expand and in that moment there is the experience, experiential recognition that yes, what is the root of my being is impersonal consciousness. And then if something um, requires attention, that expanded consciousness can seem to contract a little bit into the body, but the contraction now is not such that it becomes problematic. Um, the understanding is still there, but throughout the day, the consciousness can expand and contract. Um, even what is being called contracted now is significantly more expanded than the contraction that was there when there was the misunderstanding of what I am. So, relatively speaking, the contracted sense of I that functions through the body when action is required is still significantly more expanded than the contracted I when there is the belief that I am an individual human being with volition and not connected to anything. Um, <clears throat> but it can be quite subtle, especially when the contrast um, of the old sense of me falls away, then what's left becomes um, well, it seems to become so normal. It loses its sense of um, extraordinariness. Uh, and so you carry on living your life as the individual um, with different states of consciousness happening throughout the day, peak experiences happening from time to time, but none of that is what's important. Um, the expanded state of consciousness is not any, real, any different to the um, state of consciousness which is centralized in the body. Um, peak experiences are actually seen to be pleasure, um, peak pleasures or mystical pleasures, um, and that is not what is important. What's important is the underlying 
sense of peace of mind that remains unbroken. And what we're looking for is something that remains constant. So to focus on aspects of the self that um, come and go, like bliss or love, um, can create some confusion because it can create the idea that this will remain constant when the nature of it is actually not to remain constant but to come and go. And if we then identify correctly with what stays, which is peace of mind, then our search um, can become much more focused. What it is, is what I'm looking for is not a state of being in love with everyone, being in love with everything. It's actually a state of living life for the rest of my life as a human being with continuous unbroken peace of mind, which is not something I do, but something that now happens spontaneously because of the recognition of what my essence is. Um, and that recognition is actually simply the absence of the ideas that previously obscured what is always and has always been there. And that's why this is possible. This state is possible to be there because of what our true nature is. If our true nature was not um, awareness or consciousness, which is not part of the flow of life, which is not affected by the comings and goings of life, not affected by pleasure and pain, then we would be doomed to be in the flow of life. Because our true nature is what it is, is awareness, is the very thing in which everything arises, is the very thing in which everything is made of, which therefore means nothing is separate from it, nothing can attack it, nothing can diminish it, nothing can cut it in half. Because that's our nature, the recognition that this is our nature means that continuous unbroken peace of mind um, can function. And then we recognize that that peace of mind is not peace of mind for the individual. It is the very nature, which is the absence of the very notion of suffering, um, that's all that peace of mind is. It's the absence of the notion of suffering because our nature is incapable of suffering because there's nothing to attack it. And then naturally we find that love is there and we don't need to define that love. We don't need to try and create it. We don't need to try and aim for it. It will be there because it is an, an aspect of what we are. Um, Any questions or comments arise? Um. Um, I don't. Does you welcome to ask the question? We'll just deal with one to start with, because um, I did I did want to go th into the description of um, the dream, because to talk about our true nature as awareness is one thing, um, and it can seem conceptual also, um, but I'd like to give an explanation of um, why what we are is awareness, and then hopefully um, that framework, that explanation, which becomes... Um, the framework from which life is seen as after the changes become complete. Um, that is an explanation, um, not just conceptually, but an explanation that comes from an experiential perspective um, that demonstrates what our true nature actually is. Um, our true nature is awareness. Yeah, true, yeah. Just, uh, I'll wait till the end. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Did um, is is everyone happy if I give that explanation, or did? Sure. Yeah. Mm. 
Um, one thing we spoke about previously is the difference between involvement and witnessing. Involvement is um, what happens when we are convinced that our happiness is to be found in pleasure. Um, and witnessing is what happens when pleasure and pain are seen to be two ends of the spectrum of the flow of life that are inevitably going to um, come and go, pleasure sometimes, pain other times, and a continuous um, falling away of one and the arising of another. Um, and witnessing happens when that is understood and life is allowed to flow without us getting in the way of it, without us resisting um, what happens. So involvement is um, being attached to outcomes. Witnessing is being unattached to outcomes. And so when witnessing happens, and witnessing by its very nature is to just watch. Awareness, which we've been told time and time again is what our true nature is. Consciousness is all there is. Consciousness is what we are. And the words awareness and consciousness are interchangeable. In some teachings, awareness is the word used for the ultimate and consciousness is used for what functions through the individual. In other teachings, awareness is that which functions through the individual and consciousness is the ultimate. So in this description, we can use awareness and consciousness as more or less interchangeable for the time being. Um, so awareness, just the word awareness suggests, it doesn't suggest doing, it doesn't suggest thinking. So if our nature is awareness, um, it really means to be aware, to watch, to recognize. Um, and witnessing, um, we can then conclude is what happens when awareness is functioning in its uninvolved nature. So awareness, <clears throat> whether we recognize it or not, is always functioning. Awareness is the very thing that allows us to see that there are five fingers being held up. Awareness is the very thing that allows us to see trees and birds. Awareness is what allows us to recognize thoughts and feel emotions. Um, <clears throat> when that awareness is accompanied by the sense of personal doership, by the belief that um, it is I, the body, that has created this awareness or this function, um, this consciousness, um, when that belief is there, then awareness isn't aware of itself, but rather just aware of objects. And the awareness is taken for granted, in a sense, never recognized. But it's always functioning, and that's why when there is this awakening experience, um, awareness becomes aware of itself, and there is this recognition, ah, this has always been here. This will never go anywhere. It's the basic, um, it's the basis of daily living. Without awareness, daily living wouldn't happen. Without awareness, we would be in a state of deep sleep. Um, awakening is simply awareness that is always functioning, waking up to the fact that it is actually there, waking up to the fact that it is the background, it is the basis in which everything arises. Um, so going back to witnessing, witnessing is the function of awareness in its uninvolved state. So when awareness has woken up to itself and the idea I am this body has fallen away, awareness functions as the witness or as witnessing no entity that is doing the witnessing, just witnessing. Um, witnessing is watching without involvement, watching without resistance, watching without judgment, watching without trying to change what is happening, accepting everything as a happening, as an experience in the moment. Um, if So that that is experientially there when we sit back we drop the notion that there's anything to do, drop the notion that I am a body, um, easier done when one's eyes are closed and we go into a meditation, we drop the idea that I'm sitting in a chair, which can't be verified in that moment with one's eyes closed, drop the idea that I went into meditation two minutes ago and just be with what is, then the ideas of who we are can relax, 
and what's left is this watching, this witnessing. Um, it may feel like the space is watching or witnessing. Um, and if we don't label anything, if we don't um, label what we are, we might just come to see, not with thought, not with vision, but just a knowing that I am this space. I am witnessing. And it's not something that is known because we think it. In the absence of all thought, what's left is this space with the sense of I am, the sense of existence, in which everything arises. And if that's our nature, then we don't need to think I am this. We just, there is the state of being. Um, and in that state of being, we are. We are what we are. I am that I am. Um, no question arising, what am I? No answer required. We are just in a state of being. When we open our eyes, that state of being is flooded by all of these images. But what was there with our eyes closed is still here in this moment. It's still the background of this um, present experience. The sights that flood, the images that flood can tend to distract, um, which is why awareness has um, forgotten about itself or um, has become convinced it doesn't actually, that awareness is not there. Um, but regardless of the fact that the images the distract, it's still there in the background, just like the screen at the cinema the images are projected onto the screen, but the screen actually never changes. The screen is unaffected. Um, and so awareness is the background of every experience, even dream state. And so this is not just conceptual. This is something that if we're quiet, if we don't ask, what am I? If we don't go and look for answers somewhere, um, if we don't wait for answers to come to us, that's what's there. It's very... Um, it, it doesn't happen easily because the mind is so used to moving all the time, looking for an answer, projecting outwards as to what it thinks it is and what it um, thinks it needs. But if we find ourselves able to settle, if the mind settles and doesn't ask any questions, there is just a state of being. And in that state of being, experientially, there is awareness. Um, and in that moment, we recognize all of the images, all of the sounds, all of the objects, all of the thoughts, all of the emotions. Um, the belief that I am this or I am that, I am good, I am bad. It becomes recognized that any object that arises, arises within this awareness. If you take the awareness away, the object would collapse. So the object and the awareness are actually not separate, they're interdependent. Um, and if they are interdependent and everything arises in awareness or consciousness, we can then say that everything is made of awareness or consciousness. That um, what we think is solid is not actually solid, but is an experience of being solid. And that experience is an experience within awareness, made of awareness and recognized by awareness. So all there is is awareness or all there is is consciousness. Everything is consciousness. Um, now, how do we explain that theoretically into a framework that makes sense to us? Because the idea that all of this is arising in consciousness may be recognized in a meditation, but then to extrapolate it out and say, well, this is what's happening when there's a three-dimensional world with physical objects in it may be a bit of a stretch for us to do. So if we take the example of our dream at night and we assume for a moment that Roger 40 is a real separate entity and that when he goes to bed at night, he can dream or he does dream and that he's the creator of his dream. <clears throat> um, when Roger 40 goes to sleep and dreams about a, a, a beach scenario um, and Roger... 25 becomes the main character in that dream. That dream is happening in the mind of Roger 40 who is sleeping. Whatever happens in the dream 
only happens because Roger Forty's consciousness or Roger Forty's mind is thinking it into existence. <coughs> um, from within the dream, Roger 25 will feel himself to be real, made of flesh um, with blood running through him, um, will feel the sand to be separate from him, will feel the ocean to be separate and have a different sensation to sand. He will seemingly have senses, eyes, ears, nose. Um, and from within the dream, the assumption is I am real. I am separate from everything else that happens in the dream. Um, and everything is made of its own unique stuff. The sand is made of sand stuff. The water is made of water stuff. And I am made of Roger stuff. From outside of the dream, we realize that the conclusions made within the dream are conclusions that have been included in the dream. Roger 25 cannot conclude anything. Roger 25 can't think anything without it being part of the dream. Um, Roger 25 is actually not separate from the water or the sand. He's not separate from the mind of uh, Roger 40. Everything is contained within the mind of Roger 40 and made of Roger 40 mind stuff. The way that the dream unfolds, um, Roger 25 getting up and walking to the ocean, diving in, feeling the sensation of the water on his face, um, feeling the sun on his skin, um, other people getting up and going to buy drinks and walking towards the ocean. All of that is happening exactly as Roger Forty's consciousness or mind is creating it to happen. The 100 people on the beach in hello. The 100 people um, on the beach in um, the dream are not actually separate, independent people in control of their actions. They're all doing exactly what Roger Forty's mind is creating them to do. They may well have the thoughts arising if one was if Roger 25 was to go up and ask them are you real? They might have the thought of course I'm real but that thought is part of the dream as created by Roger 40. That's where we're going. Look around. Who am I? And what are you? Potentially we are just objects in a universal mind, in a dream, with beliefs that have been given to us um, in order to create a certain experience in the moment, to create a dream exactly as the dreamer would like the dream to be. So if we consider the notion, and this is what mystics have been telling us for thousands of years, this is what we get to experience for ourselves within certain peak experiences. This is what becomes um, the only viable explanation. In fact, every other explanation gets shown to be totally um, unimaginably incorrect. Um, and this is what's left as we go through the process of coming to understand ourselves. Um, we come to see that what this is, is a dream within a universal mind. And what mind is made of is consciousness. So we can say a dream within a universal consciousness. Unfolding exactly as it has been created to unfold. Arising within the universal consciousness made of universal consciousness and recognized by universal consciousness. In the dream, the consciousness or awareness that functions through Roger 25 is actually the consciousness of Roger 40, assuming that Roger 40 is a separate independent being not part of a dream. But now we come to see with this explanation that actually Roger 40 is in himself just an object in a dream. And so when he goes to sleep, it's just a dream within a dream. So Roger 25 is a dream character within another dream. And so if 
um, we now say that Roger Forty is a dream character, where does the consciousness that is functioning through Roger Forty come from? Where is the consciousness, if Sunshine is a character, where is the consciousness that functions through Sunshine coming from? Hmm? I'm still thinking of something like uh, it might be a dream, it's true. Mm. But if, I don't know, maybe you were very accustomed to, to f believe that it's uh, real, you know, separate. But, uh, like in my dream, you know, if something happened and my head get cut, you know, I wake up and it's still there, you know. If, if in the daily life my hand will get cut, it will get cut. Yeah, you know? so we can conclude that the rules of this dream have been set to be quite specific. So the creator of the dream has set rules by which the dream unfolds. Gravity is a rule that has been put in place as part of the dream framework. Time and space is um, the framework in which the dream arises. And so the dreamer only dreams in... Ah, uh, but that's, yes, that's a different, that's the dream within the dream. Mm. In this waking dream, um, the rules seem to be fairly consistent. Ah, you mean the real world. In, in the real world, the, which yeah. could be a dream. Yeah. The dreamer, the universal consciousness, has set fairly consistent rules. These are rules which physics, which is just a functioning within the dream, have defined as the laws of physics. Um, the laws of physics are not accidental as most scientists would have you believe but rather created within the dream in order for the dream to unfold according to certain mechanisms the mechanism of cause and effect but that mechanism of cause and effect is just an appearance actually what happens moment to moment happens because the dreamer has dreamt it that way so if this is a dream within a universal consciousness at any moment an oak tree could appear here an oak tree that um, could look like it was a hundred years old and wasn't here one minute, next minute it appears. But because this dream has been designed in order to create an illusion, to create the illusion of separateness, to create the illusion that we are real and independent and that this environment is real and independent, that this is a time-space continuum, in order for us to really believe that it's real, and for suffering to arise so that the source can experience what it can never be, which is separate, um, in order for the illusion to maintain itself, the dreamer, the source, doesn't break the rules, doesn't create an oak tree um, where an oak tree didn't exist. Because if it did, we'd have to question whether things were as real as we thought. If apples start floating past, the illusion wouldn't uh, hold water, wouldn't maintain itself for very long. But because the dreamer has included these laws and has designed the dream to unfold according to these laws very consistently, the illusion remains present. So this consciousness that is functioning through Roger, 40, and through Sunshine, um, on the basis that the consciousness functioning through Roger, 25, in the dream is actually the consciousness of Roger, 40, who is sleeping, then we would say that the consciousness functioning through Roger, 40, here, is actually the consciousness of the universal mind that is creating the dream. And the consciousness functioning through sunshine is also the consciousness of the universal mind which is creating the dream. So what is functioning through sunshine is not different to what is functioning through Roger. You and I are one in the same consciousness. But as we know, the individual bodies have their own genes and conditioning. They are differentiated from each other with unique genetic code, personality types, different conditioning and therefore the expression through each of the body even though it is the one universal consciousness the expression is unique through each of the different um, human beings
then there is separation. There, there is, is identity. There is apparent differentiation. But when we look at the root of that differentiation or the root of that expression, we find that it is the one undifferentiated source, the one impersonal consciousness, identifying with all of the seven billion, assuming there are seven billion humans, all of the seven billion human beings, and functioning as personal consciousness. But when the human being dies, so this was your point, is that if someone chops your head off, the rule in this dream is that death of the body means ending of the dream from that particular perspective and the rule is that if um, certain uh, hurts physical hurts happen to the body then the body will die or not die depending on so a bullet through the heart has been known in most cases in fact probably all cases to kill the individual so that's one of the rules that has been set up um, and when that body dies, the consciousness, which is the impersonal consciousness that has linked to it, simply retracts back to where it came from, which it never was separate from. It's like a tentacle coming out of consciousness and identifying with all of the human beings. And so death of the human is simply the returning of consciousness back to its origin. But who set up this world? No, animals are the same. Plants? Plants are the same. There is... Um, uh, anything out of it? Hmm? Is no. Anything out of it? No, even... Um, so plants don't have consciousness. Plants have prana or life energy. They, you can say they're alive. But they don't have the capacity to be conscious because they don't have um, instrumentation. And within this dream, in order for there to be conscious, there needs to be a brain a brain um, through which the consciousness functions um, animals also have brains they're not conscious no animals are conscious if you hold five fingers up they can see or if you put food out for your dog they're conscious or aware of the fact that food has been placed what um, when we use the word conscious we can say humans are we um, say humans are unconscious but that often relate that's a um, that's a specific use of the word conscious because in daily living all humans are always fully conscious um, they are aware of whatever is in their field of vision in the spiritual term fully conscious means consciousness aware of itself and so most people on that basis are unconscious but if we use consciousness in its unconscious means um, in deep sleep or in sedation. So the word unconscious can be used in different contexts. So a dog is not aware of itself. Conscious. But it is conscious. It's not aware of itself conscious. The it's not aware of his being aware. That's right. Yeah. He's actually unconscious. Well, he, he's unconscious from the um, spiritual sense. Yes. If you are not aware of your consciousness, in spirituality we say we're unconscious. But actually, if you are unconscious, you're lying on the floor, yeah. unable to do anything. Yeah. Okay, so two, two different okay. levels, yeah. And so animals have consciousness functioning through them because they are aware of food, they are aware of dangers. Um, but an animal will never wake up to itself because the complexity of the brain is in the dream hasn't been designed in order th for them to be self-aware mm. humans actually are the only biological instrument in in the world that has the capacity because of the um, uh, the complexity of a human brain the only animal which is able to be self-aware but even this word self-awareness um, all humans are self-aware they have the sense that I exist but self-aware doesn't mean enlightened. Um, so we have self-awareness and all humans have the feeling I exist. Dogs don't um, have the capacity to, th to feel I exist. A dog will never say, why did you do this to me? Humans, because of their capacity to be self-aware, are always saying, why did you do this? You shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Causes su so self-awareness causes suffering. Yes. But it's also this capacity of self-awareness which... Um, allows humans to become enlightened 
Um, and so the um, power of self-awareness is a sort of dubious gift. It can be troublesome yes. or it can be um, uh, the source of a fantastic realization. Yes. That's what we are talking about. That's what, like, yeah. That's what mean that all is, how do you call it? Sur source, or is source or consciousness. consciousness. Um, well, so what we're saying is that the, the um, different objects in the world have different capacities of consciousness. So humans have um, the biggest capacity of consciousness. Then you have animals, and there are different complexities of animals um, that are conscious of the external world. Then you go to animate objects like plants but which don't have the capacity of consciousness and then you have inanimate objects like rocks and mountains um, and the question is are they all made of consciousness are they all source um, and my explanation um, is yes they are all made of consciousness but they don't all have the capacity to be conscious and when <clears throat> they are made of conscious is because you missed the beginning explanation is <clears throat> no that's okay is that this is all a dream potentially so this is the framework given um, in which we can start to look at life differently and then by looking at it differently and considering is it all a dream these shifts in consciousness these shifts in perspective can happen and when the shifts in perspective happen you go wow now I think that there's a much bigger chance that it's all a dream. And as we keep looking from these shifting perspectives, then at the end of it, it becomes clear that actually everything is arising in the moment. That especially when witnessing is ever present, um, from the witness point of view, the witness is like um, someone in the audience watching a film. The witness is just watching everything happening. It has... Um, it's very clear that it doesn't create any thing that is happening. The witness um, doesn't first think about what to create and then witness it. The witness is just watching everything happening. So um, from that point of view, it becomes very clear that actually I am not the creator um, in this moment. As the witness, I'm not the creator. Um, and everything is arising within what is witnessing um, because the witnessing is the functioning of awareness um, and from the point of view of um, the witness or witnessing it becomes very clear that nothing is separate from awareness that everything is contained within awareness everything is made of awareness and everything is witnessed or um, recognized by awareness um, but until that witnessing becomes more and more ingrained, this sounds like just fanciful concepts. So to give an explanation that we can um, consider, which is that this is actually a dream happening within a universal consciousness, within a universal mind, just like the dream that you might have when you go to sleep is a dream happening in your mind, um, and that whatever happens in the dream is created by your mind, and is not separate from your mind, is contained within your mind, made of your mind stuff and recognized by your mind. So with the investigation that maybe this is just a bigger dream happening within a universal mind and the whole universe is arising within this universal mind and that whatever happens moment to moment, these words are coming out, um, not because Roger is making them, but rather because they are part of the dream and that your listening is not because you have chosen to be here but because the way the dream has been written is that you had to be here in this moment and the reaction to the words is not your reaction but rather a reaction happening within the dream and the whole dream is arising within universal consciousness or universal mind made by universal mind and the whole of the dream from the beginning to the end has already been created. 
So life, if it is a dream, is totally predetermined. Whatever happens in life is not your doing or my doing, but rather a happening according to God's will. No, I'm saying that God is the universal mind, the universal consciousness in which the dream arises. So there is just like in your dream, there is nothing that is in the dream that is separate from your mind. Everything in your dream arises in your mind. So in this dream, everything arises in God or in universal mind. So when I say God's will, we could say universal mind will. But by will, you also mean, do you also mean determination or control or some sort of pre-thinking or pre-logic? Or yes, will means that it is God that wants it to happen, that God controls everything. But God is not a separate entity outside controlling everything. God is the word that we're using for universal mind and at first universal mind is at rest um, and universal mind at rest means it's not creating any dream and at its, in its rest form it is pure potentiality creative potentiality but not in its expressed form and at some point it explodes into manifestation which is its potentiality be becoming manifest. And so actually God doesn't spit out the manifestation, but rather God becomes the manifestation. The nothing becomes everything, and the everything contains everything. Everything is made of everything, and everything is watched by everything. So um, universal mind at rest, becomes universal mind and movement and mind the nature of mind is consciousness or awareness so if we change the word universal mind to universal consciousness then we say everything is made of universal consciousness everything arises within universal consciousness everything is watched by universal consciousness you can change it to God everything arises within God everything is made of God everything is watched by God um, you know, whether you use the word absolute, God, consciousness, mind, we need a flexibility to recognize actually these are just words to describe um, a source, so source is always God, a source of everything. And the source in its most basic form is absolute nothing, pure potentiality, and at some point it explodes into manifestation. Well, it's a point prior to time. Um, because time exists within the manifestation, but just for the explanation, we will say it is at rest, as absolute nothing, and at a point when the mind, um, when the potential builds up to, to a point where it explodes into manifestation. It's a point, you could say, when, when source decides to manifest, it could be random. All of that is outside of the manifestation and not explainable by the laws of time and space as we understand it. But, but, but I don't get these, these words, decide, will. This is what I okay, so from, from the perspective of you and I within the dream, so from your perspective and my perspective, whatever is happening moment to moment is not my will. I am not creating what happens moment to moment and you're not creating what happens moment to moment. We go through life believing that actually I am in control and I must make things happen and you're in control and you must do good things to me, I must do good things to you. If you do bad things to me, then I hate you. That's how we go through life. If we start to see life as a dream, we say everything that happens is God's 
will. God is making it happen, not you or me. We are just the objects through which what God has created is happening. We are part of what God has created. So, thy will be done, not my will. I understand what you're saying because that's because we have definitions of words. So if I, um, if if we say will, what we've always grown up with, will being personal. Like will means my personal control. Um, but in this case, we're now using the word God's will in relation to this explanation that um, this. Uh, manifestation, daily life as it happens, moment to moment, is a dream creation within God. So God has become the creation. So already we're saying there is no separation. There is no God outside. Um, but what, and so what we're saying is that from the perspective of you and I within the dream, um, at first we will say that it's God's will, so we are separate from God. And God is separate from what's happening. As our understanding changes, we come with this explanation and then a viewing of life. We say, actually, there is no separate me from the other. And there is no separate God from me. That everything is a spontaneous happening in the moment. That cause and effect is something that happens within the dream only. It's how the dream has been designed to be experienced and how the dream has been designed to unfold. So the dream has been designed within a framework of time and space. In a spontaneity. Design is yeah. opposite to well, spontaneity. Okay, but now we're saying that um, the source has created all of time from beginning to end in an instant. At one In one instant, because... Um, prior to space and time existing within the dream, there was eternity, no time. So the idea that Source um, created something like writing a book doesn't make sense in eternity, which is why Source at rest, which is pure potential creativity, immense potential creativity, just explodes in an instant, not even time. And the whole of time is created in a moment and that this is just unfolding according to time as viewed from within the creation so time and space are not real time and space are just appearances part of the dream illusion when the dream collapses when the dream finishes there is no time and space outside of the dream time and space only exist within the dream the source is not time-bound, not space-bound. That's why the source is said to be infinite and eternal. So infinite and eternal doesn't mean um, uh, total space and total time. It means the absence of space and the absence of time. So um, the descriptions here are, may be confusing if we don't open, become open-minded in the words because we're talking within a time-space continuum using language that has been developed on this time-space continuum as part of the dream. And what we're trying to describe is um, actually something that originates or the source is prior to this. So we need to be quite flexible. Yeah, but also the words, the fact that there are different words, in my case, to my brain, is very useful mm -hmm. because it points in different ways. Yes. Like Because I am asking for definition of the words, but like for me, it's being useful yeah. because it's pointing in different ways. It's not a matter of discussing the vocabulary. Why I'm doing it. I don't know. No, no. It's important to define what we mean by these things. So, God's will is um, at first when we're still feeling separate, 
and considering is it all a dream, we start off saying it's God's will. Then as we look at it more and more, we realize actually there is no separate God from what's happening now. And so the idea that there is a God controlling falls away. Um, and so we start off with dualistic language and then the understanding negates the dualism within the language. Um, so the dualistic language can start off being useful and then the understanding um, makes everything clear. Um, but it's good that you are, because it, your question showed that there is, at least you're hear, hearing quite clearly, that there isn't a separate God. There isn't a God controlling everyone like, like puppets. It's God has become the manifestation. And even the word become implies time. So what we're saying is become, it has exploded from nothing to everything prior to time, and then time exists within that explosion. And because we're saying God is immense creative potentiality and we can see by what is created that um, if it was a very simple creation, we'd have to say, well, God isn't that immense. Um, and the words used are omnipresent, omnipotent um, for God historically, which means like super powerful, um, beyond powerful, omnipotent is beyond powerful um, and we can see that this creation is so detailed so complex so vast that God has to be source has to be immensely creative and just like Leonardo da Vinci if he was a uh, an absolute creative master whatever he produces is going to be brilliant because of his nature and so that's just an analogy. So if we now look at what God has created, we have and say that God has become this. So Leonardo da Vinci really is not separate from what he creates. Within time and space continuum, he's going to create a, what seems like a separate statue. But actually that statue is Leonardo da Vinci's creative energy. Um, and so God has become this. And because it's so vast and so unimaginably creative we then conclude that before the manifestation even the word before implies time but um, at rest God is pure potential immense creativity whatever he creates is going to be extremely creative and that's what this illusion of life is is a very creative dream Mm -hmm. I, still, this is still yeah. But mind. when you look at it, there is cause and effect, right? So um, I ask a question, you give an answer. Um, you ask a question, I give an answer. Um, we throw a stone at a piece of glass, the glass breaks. You um, have dominoes, you push one domino and it creates a whole reaction, chain reaction. All of evolution um, from the beginning of the Big Bang to now is an evolution um, within time, an evolution of cause and effect. Um, so there's no doubting that the dream has been designed for it to appear to be based on cause and effect. So we can't deny that. If we deny that, we're now <coughs> overlooking um, the mechanism by which life unfolds. So the mechanism that life unfolds is cause and effect. But actually, if it's a dream, we realize that one moment is all there is. There only ever is this present moment. And there must be um, a whole lot of different frames, flipping them so images, being projected onto the present moment to create the appearance of time-space continuum to create the appearance of cause and effect. So actually each moment is spontaneously created and has nothing to do with the previous moment, has nothing to do with the next moment. This is where we come into the present moment without worrying about the past, without expectation. 
but we recognize that the way the the illusion has been created is in order to make it look like there is time look like cause and effect is real so the understanding is actually everything is spontaneous cause and effect is not ultimately the real cause spontaneous creation is the real cause but spontaneous creation is source becoming everything and so from this point of view we can say that the moment is continually collapsing and recreating collapsing recreating collapsing recreating um, but from within the dream it doesn't appear like it's collapsing recreating <coughs> so in this moment you have a memory of having gone to school when you were young that memory makes it seem like time and space is real but actually the memory is just a thought in this moment you can't verify whether it's true or not but because the memory is <coughs> there it creates the experience that I used to be a little girl actually we don't exist except for in this moment anything else is assumption but it's there because it was designed for that thought that memory to be there memories aren't going to stop being there um, so even when we see it's a dream and it's all a spontaneous creation memories will still be there but now we'll recognize them for what they are which is just a thought in the moment in order to make the dream appear a certain way um, but we won't necessarily relate to them as though they are absolutely real what people are thinking, identify what people are feeling, and I create the uh, explanation around it. And this is creating a suffering. Mm -hmm. And this, this, I don't want this. <laughs> so how can I stop this? You un so if it's all a dream, you are not the doer. I am not the doer. You are not the creator, I am not the creator. It is not your will or my will, but God's will. So for you to want to find an answer um, about what you can do to stop or start something is to not recognize that actually our life is destined to unfold exactly as it unfolds and then to continue to create suffering by looking for an answer that will never be found. The answer is you are not the doer, I am not the doer. So there is nothing we can do. However, the dream does continue to unfold moment to moment. Um, and the way it's been designed, cause and effect, means that if we have this discussion that is pointing out, you are not the doer, I am not the doer, it could well be that that is part of the conditioning in the moment that changes Nuria because we are always being reconditioned changes her in such a way that in the future suffering doesn't arise and if suffering doesn't arise in the future it's because the dream has determined that at that point at this point new conditioning is happening and because new conditioning has happened that suffering in the future doesn't make sense to be included in the dream so it's impersonal it's like life is shaping us moment to moment just like the river is shaping the pe pebble and we don't know how we're going to be shaped. But given that you find yourself in a discussion like this, is positive. Yeah, like if conditioning is something that can change. So yeah. this conditioning to stop my suffering can then be reconditioned and I will start suffering again. Yes, but the nature of this dream is that once the false conditioning about who we are um, is removed, and that's all this new conditioning is. This new conditioning is not to be taken on as new ideas to hold on to. They are just ideas that attack the old conditioning. And once the old conditioning is attacked, it falls away. And then even these new ideas fall away. So Ramana Maharshi said, 
in relation to spiritual concepts. Use this thorn to remove the thorn that is embedded in your hand, but then remember to throw both thorns away. And the reason that we don't need a concept of everything being predetermined, that what we are is awareness, once the change has happened is because this is how it is and so we don't need to think it, it just is. It's true. It's, yes. The reason that um, we feel disconnected from ourselves, that we ask the question, who am I, is because not, the truth is always there, what we are is always there. It, but what we have are these false ideas that are covering it up. So the process is simply about getting rid of the false ideas, pointing out concepts that we hold as truths um, and when they are seen to be false, they fall away. And when they fall away, what has always been there is left behind.